Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm pleased to be here. New York Times bestselling author Emily Rapp Black has become renowned for her complex, unsparing, and wide-ranging writing. She's the author of Poster Child, a memoir, and The Still Point of the Turning World. Her essays have appeared everywhere from Vogue to the New York Times, and she was recently named to the nonfiction editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. Just this afternoon, she published a piece in Newsweek entitled, Why Ableist Language Needs to Change. She's currently Associate Professor of Creative Writing at the University of California, Riverside, where she also teaches in the School of Medicine. She's here to talk about her new book, Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg. This evening, she will be joined in conversation with Katie Ford, author of If You Have to Go and three previous collections of poems. Katie and Emily attended Divinity School together 23 years ago, where they first read each other's work. Thank you all so much for being here. Emily and Katie, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much for that intro. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And um, hello to the Free Library of Philadelphia and everyone here. I'm so happy to uh, get to talk with Emily Rat Black about this new book. Um, uh, we do know each other very well. We've we've been friends for 23 years. We have just counted the years, <laughs> and um, we feel old. And uh, yet, I think we're both glad not to be. 23 when we were kind of starting out writing um so i think emily what i first just want the audience to hear about is uh with this book of yours um your fourth book uh why is it and how is it that your relationship to frida Kahlo, her journals and her paintings how did that begin for you mm -hmm. and how did it develop over time um one thing that's interesting to me just having known you so long is i don't recall you talking about frida kahlo mm -hmm. in the early years when i knew you and so i wonder kind of when that really started to um manifest for you and into this book too right yes th okay first of all thank you for doing this with me so katie is one of the people i dedicated this book to so we have known each other in a long time. Um, and I, I think it's a great question. I mean, in high school and in college, I was very taken with her, with her story, with her paintings. I thought I was gonna become a painter for a while, which was a complete disaster, because I can't do it. Um, and it was a kind of secret relationship because I wasn't really, um, I wasn't really acknowledging that I had a disability, which I know people, it's, it's me sound weird to people, but I was able to sort of hide it for a really long time and pass, if you will, as, as able-bodied. And so it was a very secret relationship in many ways. Um, in divinity school, I think I was too busy trying to figure out like <laughs> what, what was happening in the Greek class. <laughs> but I, I did have a moment when I was in one of, the, I think it was the Widener Stacks and I was wandering around and I saw this book with a picture of Frida Kahlo in a wheelchair painting. And it was by a woman called Rosemary Garland Thompson, who then later became my mentor and my friend. So I was trying to sort of, I think I was trying to write about her, but because she was an artist and I am not, I, or not a visual artist, I didn't quite know what to say about her. And at that time I wasn't writing nonfiction at all. I was, I mean, I was writing papers and, and short stories, right? And short stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. fiction. Like I was, I was, I didn't know that nonfiction was even a thing. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still don't know if it's a thing. But anyway, I didn't yeah, really yeah, have yeah. another frame to to kind of put around it. Yeah. And the there is a very charming passage in the book about you taking painting in college and um, not being all that great at it, and oh, the teacher. Oh, oh, oh. But the teacher actually saying to you, okay, you can't really paint, but <laughs> you might still have some things, you know, in common with Rita, like Rita yeah. Kahlo that she was recognizing in you a, a tie 
yeah. is a particular form of physical suffering, you yeah. know? So yeah. I, I wonder then if you could talk a little bit about just your, because the book really, it, it, it impresses upon you as a reader that you have a relationship with Frida Kahlo mm -hmm. across time and space and culture and all kinds of differences. You're not at all trying to draw a parallel between your lives. And I think that's something that should, needs to really be held in mind as readers um, are reading this book, that it's, that's not at all, and you're very careful to say that, that mm -hmm. we're not the same. <laughs> and, yeah. and yet there's a kind of tie imaginatively that you, mm -hmm. that binds you to her. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could explain that the role of the imagination in, in forging that relationship with yeah, the artist, pretty... you know, with this artist. It's a great question. I mean, I, before I kind of fell into Frida Kahlo's painting and then her diary, which was published later, I had an imaginary friend who I called Jenny. Not a very, I don't know why I chose that name. And she was like, I don't know why I was going to be named Jenny. It's not oh, it's me. Not you. So, yeah. <laughs> it's me. I just didn't know you yet. And she, Jenny was like a pioneer woman. And like she, when we would go hiking as a family, I'd be like, Jenny's going up to her cabin. So I always oh, had okay. very, I, know, I had a very imaginative sort of like, I had an imaginary friend and I had a very active imagination because, you know, kids do. And I was also, you know, on the path to be a writer. I didn't know that yet. So Frida Kahlo has this beautiful passage in her in her journal where she talks about this friend. Like she's she's kind of she's bed bound and, and she's kind of creates this circle and she goes through the circle in her imagination. There's a girl waiting there for her and they have this like kind of beautiful relationship where they're telling each other all their secrets and they're like confiding in one another. And it was just like a beautiful portrait of friendship. And I, I felt like that was what was happening for me, is, is it was imaginative and it was like, I mean, I I'd read everything I could get my hands on about Frida Kahlo and except for that book that um, Rosemary Garland Thompson wrote, which is a sort of a disability literary theory book. So she was taking a different sort of, you know, she was taking a different take on it. A lot of what I read was, it didn't, it didn't feel true to me that she was, you know, she, that pain was her muse and that she was sort of pathetic. And, and I, I just didn't feel that way when I looked at her art. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I kind of, you know, cultivated this relationship in my mind for a long time and, you know, finally got it out when I was, you know, 40 something, I can't remember now in my 40s, uh, right after my daughter was born, or right when she was about to be born, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, I, do, I didn't know of Kahlo's journals. Mm -hmm. And the journals, you know, this, this book really reads like an extended lyric essay to me. And what's braided in there are, you know, passages um, from the journals. And what, what was it the journals brought to light for you about Kahlo that the paintings did not, you know? Um, she had this great passage where I, think I quote in the book where she talks about how colors look. Mm -hmm. um, she imagines a shape for colors and and um, and it's it's very, it's stream of consciousness, but it's also very chatty. It's almost like she's writing a letter to herself, which in some ways a, a diary could be considered that, but 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 there's a, just so many wonderful moments of lyricism in the in the translation. Obviously, it's translated from Spanish, and what mm -hmm. I thought was great about it was just all of the sort of she ha she would make a drawing of one thing like fifty times. Like she would just keep doing it just to, to get it to the place where she thought it was right, and you know, it was sort of sort of like a, a model of revision, but you know, in, obviously in a visual artistic sense, not in the mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Were those those drawings prior to the painting of the drawing? Like, were they sketches? They were sketches. Yeah, sketches, yeah. Got or it. they were just like yeah. random one offs. Like, they weren't necessarily bolted into anything else. I mean, she also wrote a lot of letters, and I consulted her letters or I looked at her letters when I was writing this book. Um, letters that she wrote to friends, um, mm -hmm. which is always fun. Like, epistolary stuff is so interesting because, you know, the person is still kind of trying to persuade someone of a particular thing. So she, she was just, I don't know, like, I, very creative. I know that's a kind of a dopey word, but in her in her in her journals, she's more concerned with art than anything else. And which is interesting. I mean, it feels so authentic those journals because you also 
revealed that she didn't, she wasn't intending for these to be published. No. So to write mostly about art just is what she, you know, was about and was wanting to do. Yeah. Um, you also go into the fact that the journals, she really reveals the love um, she had for Diego, which is uh, stereotyped so often as a very volatile, melodramatic relationship. But that the stereotype, and then I also want to talk about the stereotypes regarding disability, but um, what is it about the love of Diego that you, you really wanted to, to write about? Because this tie between pain and love you talk about, mm -hmm. You know, um, you, I, think, yeah. I think they had a very kind of modern relationship in some sense and that she, I think he loved her independence. He loved that she was creating and doing in a time when not all women were allowed to do that. And part of that is a class issue, right? But I mean, the story I love about them is, you know, when she was a, she was 20 years older than she was. And in, when she was like in primary school, he was starting to make these massive murals, you know, and so he made one called creation and she walked by that like her whole like childhood and there's something kind of amazing about that I mean I think he was a kind of larger than life figure for her and yes their relationship has often been characterized as like she's vying for his attention and he's like Ugh, you're bedridden I'm not into it and it's not like that like in her journals I mean she's very she gets mad at him and she's sort of frustrated but then there's a moment where she's like there's no color for how much I love you like there's no way to, for me to tell anyone or even myself the complexity of my love for you and I just think that's a really amazing way of talking about connection and you know the mystery of it so I think they had an amazing relationship and they both had lovers and you know betrayals and fights but but I think ultimately like you know she they loved each other, you know, for in, in a complex way. Yeah. Yeah, and then the you are you're interested in the book too about talking about pain as something that is as mysterious as love is. You kind mm -hmm. of yoke those two as and yeah. both kind of endlessly mysterious, but fraught sometimes, beautiful, and some what they might yield, but yield. Is, is something you might, I don't think you, you're going to like that verb actually now that I've said it. No, I, I, no, I, no, I get what you're saying. No, I totally do. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think a lot of people, and, and for me too, I didn't know how much physical pain there is for someone after, you know, far after, even for you, 40 years after you had to have your own leg amputated, mm -hmm. how much physical pain you still have because mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. diseases rubbing or skin yeah. problems. And um, I just wonder what else you, you want people to kind of uh, know about um, what you've discovered kind of through Kahlo or your own experience, like what is it what are we to do with pain? It's a huge <laughs> question. But when I was reading your book, I'm like, you know, I I just kept on being lit up with kind of new insights about how to relate to pain. You mm -hmm. know, um, what is the real? What is the? Did Carlo come to a relationship with her pain, or, or have you that? I mean, I feel like you know. Did you ever read that yeah. that book, The Body in Pain, by Elaine Scarry? Uh, I I began it, and it's one of the hundreds of books that <laughs> I've read 50 pages of, but yes. Word. <laughs> so I'm going to say, so yeah. I count that Word. as a yes. <laughs> but I mean, she, talks, she talks about how pain is, like, not translatable. Like, it's, I mean, is it a hammer? Is it a pounding? Is it a whatever? And, and I think that anyone who's experienced acute pain knows that when that's happening, and certainly Frida had a lot of moments where she was in acute pain, um, you know there's no there's nothing but that you are pain like you become synonymous with the experience of pain and and your body is basically in a kind of i don't know neurological blackout if you will and in, in those really acute moments and i think you know people are always really interested in all the you know the the things that she endured and and i think there's a kind of voyeuristic quality to that I think she was like yeah i've been through pain but here i'm gonna i'm gonna show you how i envision it uh, 
here's my my column as a you know a broken a broken column that that painting is so amazing or here here's a painting of me having a miscarriage like i'm not going to i'm going to show you that it was hard and then that's all i'm going to show you and and the parts that are untranslatable are all mine yeah. and yeah. real power in that i think mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's yes i i mean that's amazing to think about just that kind of the, the places pain can take you mm -hmm. once you recognize how private they are by definition that don't no one really can companion you there no. No. even if they have the same experience mm -hmm. in as close as possible away um but so something for you about the fact that it's not translatable that it's your own that it's yours that actually feels like power mm -hmm. yeah 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 it does and i think it's also one that i don't know i feel like we like to fetishize pain we like to think of it as this kind of like you know crucible that you move through but if but if like frida you are in pain for the majority of your life what does that mean you know and like when people were saying you know she was just like bedridden and like you know she was strong and she like powered through i don't think that's actually true like she, first of all she took a lot of morphine or or you know she took a lot of painkillers but she figured out how to make art you know she like got an easel and propped it up in her bed and you know yeah. she just she wanted to make she wanted to make she wanted to create in out of this space like if pain is a kind of death of agency like she wanted to like create something that would exercise her agency and that's how we find meaning and joy Mm -hmm. Yeah, so fi kind of finding, and for you too, finding the agency in your own mm -hmm. um, physical pain, but also categories of emotional or, mm -hmm. you know, psychological, spiritual, all these categories of pain. Um, but you're also in the book very um, determined <laughs> to help us uh, or to, to kind of prevent us from thinking of pain as a muse for art. Mm -hmm. So what's the kind of, what's the stake there? Like what's the danger of that, would you say? I think the danger of that is that, you know, it's like kind of, it's, it's actually not paying the kind of attention and tribute to pain that pain deserves. Mm -hmm. You know, people that live through pain aren't rock stars. They're, they're just people. And I feel like a lot, a lot of the, the fetishizing of especially disabled women and, and disabled bodies in general has to do with like, tell me about the horrible things you went through um, so that I can feel better about myself. And, and I think that's the danger. It's like, oh, well, I'm so glad I didn't have that pain. Yeah. And actually the reality is you're gonna have something at some point no one gets out alive without something. So it's a distancing thing, I think, to say, oh, yeah. pain, like, I could never do that. She went through so much pain. Like, isn't she extraordinary? Like saying someone is extraordinary because of the pain they went through is kind of diminishing the impact of whatever art they managed to create when they were not in pain, to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you, you, you walk around the world having as someone who's absorbed a lot of daring. You know, you talk about that. People like you yeah. you say in the scene where you're at the um Frida Kahlo's house, Casa Azul, that you would rather kind of strip off your clothes and show everyone your body than be stared at for a lifetime in this type of voyeuristic wondering mm -hmm. and um kind of made me wonder just what else would you want to get rid of, you know, from people it's like the staring yeah. and, and because you teach classes on, on disability at the medical school at, at UC Riverside, as, as well as a class simply called death, <laughs> you know, you take, so you pretty much take death. come on, that's a good, that's take a it good on that you really, you really take it on. Um, and, uh, Oh, where was I going? Help my help me. Where was my mind? So a disability like uh, or yes. you're seeing, um, what would you? Yeah, what would you want to just get rid of or tell people like I, people with disability or just me? I like I don't want this and that and the other. What are those? Yeah, what are those things you would want are like 
American culture and society to just not do. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is like, don't make assumptions. Like, I'm, I really get annoyed when people, A, think they can touch me, which happens a lot in, in public. Like if I'm wearing shorts and I get a lot of padded, padded back and, you know, like, oh, you know, I, you know, I, it's always like an older man, like 70 plus who says something like, it's a shame you're so pretty or something like that. And I'm like, what? Like that Thank still you. happens to me. And this is, you know, 2021. Um, right, it's 2021. Okay, I don't even know what yeah. time it is. <laughs> okay. um, so, but I think, you know, I'm an artist, but I'm not an artist because I have a disability. Like I, I would have been a writer anyway, um, but I had this material and I think writers and artists are born into a body and into a world and they make kind of alchemy with that experience and brain power and whatever else they have at their disposal. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I feel like it, it's just kind of, well, it's like when someone says, oh, it's a, it's like a queer, it's a queer um, artist or it's a queer rapper. It's a queer like hip hop person. Like, no, it's just a person who's doing that, who happens to be this other thing. Um, so I, I, I find, I really bristle at that because I, I want to be able to talk about issues that I'm passionate about and like, you know, ableism and how we can make the world more more sort of accessible both attitudinally and physically for people with non-normative bodies which is basically everyone except for maybe a few people um but i don't want to be seen as like oh the person who writes about only disability right um mm -hmm. because it's not the entire focus of my life it's a focus of my life just like okay. being a woman is not the entire focus of my life right yeah yeah so. But you, I mean, clearly you have felt pigeonholed in that way. Oh, yeah. 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 I wonder, too, because Kahlo in the labels she, you know, felt and suffered under, and then after her death, a lot of the labeling you're talking about as a, like, quote, unquote, disabled artist or um, all those things with Diego we were talking about. But do you think part of your connection to Kahlo is that, even like when you were very young and learning about her, just you you found in her someone that was suffering those same assumptions or, yeah. you know, is that part of the tie? Part of it. I mm -hmm. think part of it too is like, you know, in, in the Casa Azul, when I went when I went down to this other room that I didn't actually know was happening, I don't know why, I don't remember why I didn't know, but where they have her like artificial limb and her corsets and her and her you know, special shoes sort of displayed under climate controlled glass with like security guards with guns, like ready to, you know, I guess shoot you if you try to get too close. Um, I don't know, but like, I mean, they're, you know, they're precious objects. Yeah. And I, I just was like, oh, so interesting because it's like, what I found really hard about that was that she's no longer controlling the reveal of those things mm -hmm. about her body. Like if they're just yeah, revealed yeah. there under like glass and lights and, I think one of the things I've always struggled with as a person is like, when do you, how much of yourself do you reveal and in what context and what are the consequences of the reaction? And I think a lot of people feel this way, even when they have hidden disabilities or anything, maybe any kind of thing that's a, that makes them an outsider, how much to reveal? What's the rate of the revelation? Like what's gonna happen if I tell someone? Um, and, and that's that's an emotional thing. I also think my connection with her too is that for the longest time I hid having a prosthetic limb and I was always really into fashion. I mean, my fashion was like 80s and 90s, not that great, but <laughs> when I was first doing it, but she had these elaborate costumes, you know, and she, she, she wanted people to look at her, but she controlled what they saw. Yeah. And I very much respond to that. I see, yeah. And you, you note too that the parts of her that were most in pain, she artist like she was most decorative about mm -hmm. the corset or um, and what else? I, maybe you can tell us more. I don't recall all the things you're it's talking the leg. about. She, yeah, the leg, the, the the sort of a special shoe to like raise up the one side, mm -hmm. um, the corsets. Yeah, I mean those are things that she didn't walk around showing people I mean, she had her flowers in her hair and her elaborate rings yeah. and her beautiful dresses that were um you know s significant to her because they reflected mexican culture in this way that hadn't been done before and at least in her circles and yeah i mean she hid those things that's why it was so strange to see them it's mm -hmm. like 
you know, all of a sudden, you know, those things are living on in the world and she's not. Yeah. In, yeah, it's yeah. Just hard to articulate. Do you, I mean, it, it's certainly an ethical <laughs> problem to, you know, to reveal things that the artist didn't, it wasn't for the public. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like uh, when you were in the museum, did you feel like there was an ethical trespass going on? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say because if, if so, I was actually doing it too. Like, you know, I mean, there was a huge, like her, right. her deathbed um, had just been unsealed after, you know, she died in 1954 and had just been unsealed. And this was like 2000 and I guess 13. Well, it was right before Charlie was born, so it was 2013. And there was like, you know, people were vying to get in to have a look at where she died. That yeah. was, I mean, and listen, my son had died like not even a year before. And I did not know what to do with the feelings that I was having there because I also wanted to see. So mm -hmm. I think it's like, I, I think that is part of the, 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 and also she's very famous. She's very, she's on tote bags and magnets and I have them. Like, yeah. Ox, and she's very much, <laughs> you know, like one of the most famous faces in the world. And I thought, what, what is the value of seeing where someone died? And yet I knew so much from my own experience, having just lost my child that mm. I will never forget the place where he died. So yeah. it's like, but it's like, how much of that sacred knowledge do you need to know to make it an ethical viewing? I don't know the answer to that, but I did I know, think about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. No. When I asked that question, I knew it was not quite answerable. But and also not just you going there or, or other viewers, but actually the ethics of you know whomever was the um, controlled the estate of Kahlo. You know that that yeah. that ethical moment. Yeah. Because um, it's usually at that point when someone's letters or drafts that they never wanted seen and expressly said so. Oh well, someone wants to make a book out of it, and yeah, you know, um, like Sylvia Plath's journals. Remember when those came out? Yeah, a lot. I mean, there's in poetry. There's quite a few examples that <laughs> I think are problematic, but then they're justified because of well, do you know how much scholarship then came out because of yeah, what, yeah, we, yeah. what we learned about HD and queer poetics, and but HD didn't want things unsealed and. It, it's a really beautiful tie you're mentioning too with your son's room that you also you sealed yourself and and your parents then so lovingly went in to um dismantle after Ronan's death um yeah. that passage in the book is like is just so so beautiful I mean the language the language of this book just you know for me as a teacher of creative writing it's really a book I could teach just in terms of how to write a sentence and how to um, weave figuration and um, lyrical devices into paragraphs, not just poems, but into prose. And what about the crafting of this book? Was it different than your other books or what was the process like for you? Well, it was slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, and it took longer than I thought, and and I had a lot of, str I struggled with how to to sort of to make it a book, and in the end, I feel like what happens is it it sort of falls apart, and then it, then there's like a final moment, like it just kind of all tumbles down, and then it's kind of like something else. There's like a pinnacle moment after the, the tumble, um, but. You know, what I did was was try to range around in sort of different ways in which I had experienced the body and other people's perceptions of my body in addition to their own. So there was a lot of mirroring. Like I worked for years in the summers at Victoria's Secret. I know. This oh, is yes. before it became like hot pink. But you know, oh, this, is like, in, this is in the book. Yeah. This is oh, this whole part. So I thought to myself, like, what, how am I ever going to, like, who cares? Like, you know, like, this is not interesting. And, and, it's, and when I was there, I guess it wasn't that interesting. It was hard work. But when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh man, like all of these women as like, I was the bra fitter, like the main bra fitter, the bra manager. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I sold so many bras. 
and I would go, <laughs> I would go into the dressing rooms with these women, and and I had this easy rapport with them because I've always had kind of an easy rapport with with bodies because people have been poking me since I was like born. And I'd be like, oh, you know, you're wearing the wrong bra size tragedy. And then I'd help them find one. And every single woman hated their body. And I was just like, what's wrong with you? Like, you, you're beautiful. Like, you don't have to deal with this Barbie leg that's like needs to be oiled by the stock dudes in the background. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I mean, that endeared me to them. That was good. But it was also just like, oh, you know, when you're 18 or 16 or 17, you just you don't know yeah. what to do with yourself anyway. And then there were all these women who just seemed perfect to me, just mm -hmm. hating on themselves. It was really sad. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, it's it's kind of a revelation that, but working at Victoria's Secret, just getting this kind of, you know, slice of American body image pathology um, mm -hmm. and people bearing brunt of it and absorbing it you actually probably were educated there far more than you knew at the time. And also yeah, no. you talk about like having, you were required to, I think, weren't you required to like have your nails done and all this, like there's a performance too of sexuality that. Yeah, oh yeah, performance sexuality. You couldn't, you had to wear a size six or below. Um, oh. oh yeah. I forgot. Like, Did you say that in the book? I forgot that. I think so yeah, you had to have your hair. I, 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 I blocked it that. I you, blocked it <laughs> you had to have short, you had to have long hair. You had oh, to really yes oh, long hair, like long meaning like not a pixie cut basically yeah um, you had to wear feminine clothing which meant like you know this is the 90s so it was like a lot of floral dresses and whatever i was wearing them anyway um <laughs> and you had to get your nails done and you had to wear lipstick and you you know you had to be nice basically yeah and right, it, was, right. it was and, and wear a santa hat at, at christmas which was really the my least that was so bad i was like why am i wearing a santa hat so. <laughs> yeah. I, wow yeah yeah i mean just imagining you like the irony of your who you are as a person your character personality like you just kind of walking in with a santa hat and beholding all these women who hate their bodies and santa. and you right and you but also you joining them in that, in the book, you talk a lot about just your own struggle with how you feel about your body and not wanting to reveal your body. Like Kahlo, I love that, that, you know, that she's revealing what she wants and not more. She's, mm -hmm. it's a very controlled thing. And, um, and I guess it's a really, it's, a, it's, it's going to sound like a rather grim question, but but I think on the other side of asking this question, maybe some kind of recognition of the the value of the body or the joy of having the body might come into play. But do you think Paulo and in the journals perhaps, or just from what you gleaned by looking at her work, did she do you think she wanted to not have a body? No, I think she she very much wanted to have a body and that she was very in tune with her body in part because of the pain and in part because and this is another thing i share with her like she had polio when she was like six so that was the start of her journey of of bodily you know trauma to be honest and you know i had my leg amputated when i was four so she so every subsequent thing that kind of went on with her she, as a young kid she sort of knew how to manage it like absorb it and she absorbed it by writing and having imaginary friends and painting and yeah. thinking and so I think she was very connected to her body and I think she loved it, to be honest. Like, mm -hmm. I think, you know, what's interesting is there's so many pictures of her, and especially in the, in the latest exhibit that I talk about in the book where she's, you know, sort of naked and, and, and kind of, you know, from the waist up and, and she's very seductive, um, very like different outfits, different looks. I mean, she was like, the camera loved her mm -hmm. and she loved the camera. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I love that. I mean, I, there's a vanity in her that I love. I just think it's like, yeah, yeah. she's basically like, you know, yeah, here I am, you know, yeah, yeah, that kind of unabashed looking straight at the camera, and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I recognize that the, you know, and what she's willing to show of herself to does reflect a love. But I guess I'm also wondering, like, if pain, 
um, or self-loathing even, like mm -hmm. if that brings one to a point of just being so fatigued by the body, you know, and, yeah. but um, I, which for your book, I wonder kind of having written this book, do you feel like you came to some other place in relationship to your own body that you weren't prior to the composition of the book? I do. I mean, I feel like I really kind of dug at a lot of the things that I was afraid to say or express that I felt like mm -hmm. there's bitterness, there's jealousy, there's like nasty thoughts. And those are things that, especially for women writers of nonfiction, are not very welcome in the uh, in sort yeah. of mainstream publishing world. And and it, 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 I wouldn't say it was like an exorcism because I don't think those things ever kind of fully move out of you. But I think it did, it made me feel aligned with someone powerful. And that person was not only her, but it was also myself. And, um, mm -hmm. and the power of the body, just the existence of it. And that also came from watching my son have no power over his body and be completely, you know, devastated neurologically at the end of his life. Like, it's hard not to say, wow, I'm gonna, you know, this body is alive. Like, you don't have to love it, but the fact that it's alive sometimes is, is enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And, and perhaps that suffering, I think it probably or maybe creates a different relationship with one's own death, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, I do wanna say too, um, that to so everybody here in the audience and in a moment, we'll kind of go to some questions from the audience. So if you do have something, you could put it in the uh, Q&A box now. But uh, Emily published this year also, in addition to this book, a book called Sanctuary, which is a memoir um, uh, dealing with the death of her son, Ronan, and also with um, ideas and theories about resilience and um, the kind of double-edged <laughs> sword of that word of, mm -hmm you know, getting praised for resilience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you talk about that just like, well, I, I'm just trying to get through, I'm just trying to mm -hmm. manage. And then, and then you, um, you are writing a next book that um, I remember when you, you were going through that um, period when Ronan was ill and you told me that it, you were tired of hearing um, people tell you they couldn't imagine mm -hmm. having their child die or, or that they couldn't imagine. That was a, it's a common kind of phrase people might say to express the extremity of it. Um, and I remember you said, you know, they can imagine, they just don't want to. Mm -hmm. And well, they already and, have, and they're just too sad to face it. Yes, yeah. Um, and then you have a working title for your next book. And it's, it's also a phrase, something you've heard a lot, it sounds like. Do you, do you want to tell, you tell people, I love this title. It's called, I would die if I were you, um, which is something I hear a lot um, and still do, which is annoying, uh, not helpful, just FYI. And is that regarding, what is that regarding when they tell you that now? Um, I think it's just leg, baby, everything. Whatever, like, whatever it might be, whatever like thing of the moment is going on, and I yeah. think, I mean, the book is 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 part craft book. It's part about it's partly about what I've learned about narrative from teaching for now like twenty some almost twenty years, mm -hmm. um, and and especially about nonfiction. I think memoir has had a kind of it's it needs to have a bit of a resurgence as an intellectual pursuit and not so much about inspiring people or you know yes or right. having a happy ending and i think even though the memoir is still mostly populated by white women um white sort of heteronormative women whatever uh, mm -hmm. or heterosexual women, it's like there's there's a lot of push to have a kind of traditional happy ending and I think that's mm. you know obviously problematic, but I think you know I really don't like this idea that a that a memoir or a memoirist is a kind of life guide like that to me seems uh, 
really misguided and, and incorrect. Like, yeah. um, so, so it's about that. It's about the terrors of small talk. And I talk a little bit about Kierkegaard. I throw in some old dead white guys because God forbid if I don't throw in some dead white philosophers that I studied in divinity school. Um, <laughs> and then just like practical tips about how to get to some meaty parts of your story mm -hmm. uh, without stressing yourself out or white knuckling your computer. I see. Yeah, yeah. This is a combo. Um, yeah, I, there's questions coming in. Um, one is about the fact that you did have, and you do have two books coming out in the, the same year. Yeah. Uh, and just what led to that? Was it just accidental? Because the publishing industry sometimes can be on its own time frame. So, or what led to that? Um, me being really late with this, <laughs> like, like two years late. That's what, okay. like, I just, I couldn't finish it. And they were finally like, dude, you have to, you have to do this. And I, and I wanted to do it. I was just like, it was massive avoidance behavior. So like, I wrote a I whole other book to avoid. <laughs> and wait, they just, so you wrote, wait, you wrote the Kahlo book to avoid sanctuary? No, I wrote sanctuary to avoid Kahlo. Oh. <laughs> I started calling and I was like, oh, look, there's another project. Let's do that first. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. I mean, if, yeah, sanctuary, wow. if sanctuary is your idea of distraction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I don't know what that says about me. Many, wow. many things. Yeah. So that's why it's just an act. It was an accident. Of, it was my, my orchestrated accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another question is that there's a lot of intersectional, intersectional complexity in, in our discussion, um, especially in reading private journals that the author never expected to be published. So how do you engage with that fact? Um, I think, I think when someone's journal is published and they didn't expect it to be published, I always think of like Emily Dickinson, right? Who is, didn't she tell her sister, like, don't publish my poems or something? Uh, no, I don't believe so. They, her sister discovered her her folios okay. in her room after she died, and they okay. were they were. Right. So, I mean, she did express some desire to be known and published. And, okay, but, yeah, but in any but, case, like she didn't. She was, it was a kind of an accidental discovery, and I think like yes, yeah. you know, those poems still resonate with people across cultures. You know, centuries, decades, and centuries later. So that's that's kind of interesting. I think with Frida Kahlo, like I, I, that journal and the diary that was published, a lot of it is visual, like m mm. much of it is visual. And then the text is not, it's not super narrative, except in, in key places. Um, so the, the real sort of the narrative products that she probably didn't expect to be published, or maybe she did, it were her letters to people. Uh, so her letters yeah. are really interesting and they're very narrative and they're very, um, you know they're very personality sort of infused but mm -hmm. her journal is a lot of a lot of visuals huh. and i feel like that's i don't know i'm not a visual artist i don't know how it would feel to have a very early sketch of something published i mean i think they did a really good job in the publication the translation it's a beautiful beautiful book mm -hmm. um so i, I don't know that's, that's a good question and i don't i don't know yeah. an answer to it i don't, I don't know yeah, I guess one way to ask that question too is what um, what do you feel like about the writings, like your own writings that you haven't published and don't want published? Would you kind of, if like they I'm, were published after your death? I feel like I'll be dead, so I won't care. But like, I, I mean, honestly, like, you know, I mean, yeah, there's some things I would like. Well, I, you, <laughs> but, it, but it affects the impression of yeah, the yeah, work yeah. you yeah. that you've ever yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. Never, I've never been a diary keeper. Maybe that's why. No, well, how could you? I mean, I didn't. I, I, didn't I don't. Know. I mean, with all you've written, all the <laughs> what it, what I'm saying is, like, with all these, you've written four memoirs about your life, and um, obviously you could have as a child, but even as a well, child, you weren't writing. You weren't writing diaries. What were were you writing? in anything as a little sad, Emily? sad bad poems, and uh, like I was also rewriting Bible stories whoa wow it's so sad to make them to, to make them how you wanted them <laughs> I was, I was like kind of enliven them up a little like i think i had i had some fun with sermon on the mount i think some dinosaurs showed up and like some other <laughs> things and 
lighten yeah. it up. You, <laughs> you're like, this is entirely too serious. <laughs> um, so, which is, you know, in keeping with the Bible because a bunch of people contributed to it. Um, so no, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I'd be more mortified if like this horrible novel that I wrote was that died with a computer if that were ever resurrected and published i would just like roll over uh -huh. in my i see wave. oh so you have you completed a novel oh so bad a, and it's so bad and it's on a computer somewhere no it's gone it's gone it's oh it's gone it has been murdered you, by, you by destroyed it okay okay no, I, I had a, i had the topo chico that flew over my computer oh <laughs> and it could not be saved it could not be salvaged and i was kind of in, in a way it was kind of a relief Hmm. Yeah. I didn't want to work on it anymore. I was like, this is bad. Like I, I it's an, it's a, whatever it was a practice, mm -hmm. a practice book. Yeah. And it wasn't good. Why did you, or when did you kind of shift? Cause when I met you, you were writing short stories. You got early attention from the Atlantic for a story for a student mm -hmm. competition. Um, what, when did you shift? Like what was, what was the shift or when or why? It was in grad school and it was because I started to write, I had written a short story about a woman with a disability and that was okay. But then every other one I tried to write was really bad. Mm -hmm. And so my teacher was like, you know, how come, you know, there's all these characters with disabilities and they all seem to be the same character and they all seem to be you. <laughs> like, well, why don't you write nonfiction? And I was like, what's that? So yeah. I took the class when I was in grad school and it came, it came easily to me. And I liked it and I liked the form and I, I liked reading memoirs. And, and so I mm. guess that's, that's how, I mean, just someone encouraged me. I see. Or recognized that your fiction was a nonfiction in disguise. So that it was like, yeah, I mean, even like, even I knew that at the time I was just like, what? there's something wrong. There's something lacking here. It's like, I'm, I'm mm. hiding something. I see. Yeah. 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 Well, and you, you know, often because I teach and write poetry, I know that there's like, there's a wall in poetry where it's me and not me if I don't want it to be, but memoirists, you don't really get to have <laughs> that wall. And this book, I remember you telling me too, it, it, I think you texted me one day saying like, I'm terrified by what I'm revealing in this book, you yeah, know? It's it's and <laughs> why, you know, you did that, Kahlo re reveals things that are, you know, very, um, Kind of stridently um, uh, intimate, you know, that she she's saying, I am giving this to you. Why do that, I guess? Like, what's the, what do you think the artistic or um, just human purpose of that is? Is it I communication it's, or? I think it's distraction. I also think it's, um, you know, like I, I, the more, the older I get, the more I'm into like, really ridiculous clothes like I love ridiculous clothes and I think it's partly because <laughs> I've always liked them but now I just don't care if people think I'm ridiculous partly that's function of being getting older I think and also I just think it's um you know if someone's commenting about your clashing animal prints they're not as interested in like if you're limping or not there's that too it's like a deflection mm -hmm. like you know when you look at Frida's pictures you know of her like you're not, you don't even look at the lower half of her body most of the time because she's, there's so much going on in the hair and the flowers and the ring. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. And I think for me, I think her self portraits, the way that I interpret them is a kind of almost like a maintenance of privacy. And I, I feel like I write memoir to say like, here's everything I'm willing to tell you. And the rest of yeah. it is yeah. mine alone and you will never have access to it ever. And that feels like a really powerful, empowered place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you see, you know, you see critics um, coming at you or other writers wanting more, like wanting more than what you have offered. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if they realize really the affront of that, but let me get to another question from someone. Um, so related to what you're saying here, what are the signs that help you come to the conclusion that some of your work, like the novel you wrote, might be bad and other works are not? So where does your confidence come from? Uh, I give it to you. You tell me if it's bad. Um, no, I have <laughs> readers. Like you're one of them. I have my my friend Gina Frangello is a reader of mine. Like I think you know people think of artists still in this weird way as like sort of sitting in a beam of light, being muse filled. But I think we need readers and we need community. Yeah. And so like 
But I mean, if you're reading something that you wrote and you're bored, trouble. That was me in that novel. I was like, I am so bored. Like, I really don't care what happens next. And I wrote it. Like, that's that's kind of a pretty, that's a pretty strong barometer of like, <laughs> give it up. <laughs> a boredom, I mean, people think boredom is like a, is a shallow, um, whatever, judge of a piece of art. Mm-hmm. And even in poetry, like, if someone's bored, it's a, you know, a nail in the coffin, really. And It's especially um, in poetry, because you're, it's like a compressed meaning right it's right, right, right yeah and you talked about um poetry being really influential with this book or that a mainstay kind of mm-hmm. while you wrote it yeah I mean of course you know I I put like every Katie Ford poem I can possibly put in every book I ever read I I think you gotta like, stop epigraph, <laughs> I think epigraph, you, I'm like um, oh but I was glad in this book you would you would use something of mine and then you also repeat other poets I know. love <laughs> I branched like, out. <laughs> yeah, like, no, no, like Maggie Smith comes in a lot, an amazing poet. And I actually, once you were doing it with somebody else, like with Maggie's work, I realized like, you know what? You know what Emily doesn't do? She doesn't care about the convention of, you no, know, you use one quote from Plath and one, you know, you might then use one from Neruda or something. You use what has meant something to you and yes. I kind of you know like reading that book I'm like oh she doesn't care about the convention of epigraphs or no and I and I really started I I, I saw that then and I, I love that and I think readers you know that you're doing exactly what you want to do artistically does that because this um question is about confidence like where you get where you mm-hmm. feel confident about your work is it when you are in that that kind of groove of I'm saying it what I want to say how I want to say it or is it the artistry as well what is it all of it I think it's it's kind of this it gets back to this core belief that I have that every story that we read write um talk about say is in conversation with every other story that's ever been written said Mm -hmm. will never be written that might be written that should have been written and wasn't like it's a big conversation and for me poetry has always been this sort of like shock to the heart in a happy way it's like it makes you want to live more in some ways and and I don't mean this at all to sound dreary it's going to sound dreary but like when you watch someone die you want to live right Mm -hmm. it's an intense feeling like when when you are confronted with death the response is often to move toward life and I think with poetry the power of it is that it it kind of turns you around a little bit if it's good if it's bad, you're like, what just happened? But like, it turns you around a little bit and it, it sort of pushes you off into a new kind of being and it does it in like a page. Mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to be a really good, I'm not a good poet. Like I get one poem a year that's like not bad, but still not good. And I, I don't know, I really liked, I just have always read poetry. I've just, I just love it. I, I always yeah. read it. It's, it's, it just changes yeah. like my, my thought chemistry. Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who said this, um, but uh, there's a poet, a woman poet, um, friend of Plath and Sexton, and now I'm forgetting which friend it was, but who said that she she wanted, she knew she loved a poem, or she gravitated toward poems that made her want to keep living. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, I love who said that, actually. I, I got to look it up. I'll look it up. But <laughs> um, I heard that's a quote from that the wonderful nonfiction book called the um, the equivalents, where the poets were brought and different artists were brought to Radcliffe, for so they could have funding. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. That doesn't have anything to. <laughs> I'm going to get to another question because we have five minutes. But um, so someone asks if you want to read more diversely but an author may not want to be identified as a disabled writer or a queer poet, for example, how do you join the two or don't we? So I think you should just read what the book is about. Like mm-hmm. the, read the jacket copy or, you know, with this book, it's yeah. pretty evident because it's like an artificial limb on the cover. But I think, you know, it's like, yes, those, but those issues should be, should be present in the description of the book. It's just mm-hmm. the artist themselves is, is a, you know, not identified in this very categorical sort of, you know, 
hits this bucket, this bucket, and this bucket. But like what they're writing about, you know, has you know resonance for people in communities that may not be adequately represented otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In art. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, this sense because you were talking earlier about that the stereotype of Kahlo suffered and you suffer as a, a disabled writer and how you know, how to read someone as an indiv the individual that they are with all of those mm -hmm. um, crossings of identity. Um, but, and that you really want Kahlo and, you know, by extension, you, you yourself want to be read as an individual, you know, who has certain parts um, to your identity, just as Kahlo does and everyone does. Um, without that put, being put in that bucket, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think the question is, is if someone wants to read books by people who have disabilities, mm -hmm. but the movement is towards not wanting to be stereotyped in that way, so therefore not, uh, you know, but you're saying the book jacket kind of usually does that job. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's unfortunate, isn't it? I mean, book jacket. Book jacket um, or like so and so did this, so and so did that. I mean, there's a certain kind of, you know, language and vernacular in the in the jacket copy world. And it isn't always like representative of what's in the book, but it is trying to identify those buckets in the way yes. that the stuff inside yeah. the material inside is not doing in such an overt way. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think I like the idea that, you know um prose or language doesn't know what genre it is you know <laughs> no idea. It, care. It, it, yeah, it doesn't know what categories it's in um okay let's see probably time for one more question i have another here so when in in regards to the museum for you know Carlos home casa azul um the question has to do with the recent ex um, exhibition curated by um, the VNA, Victoria and Albert, mm -hmm. called Frida Kahlo, Making Herself Up. Mm -hmm. And it included clothes, plaster corsets, her boots, all these things. Um, it was tremendously controversial. So some mm -hmm. critics saw the personal medical objects as a revelation. Others felt that they were a distraction from her art. Um, did you know when you saw those things and you talked about it before? But did it did it change your relationship to the art that you had experienced apart from that? Those objects, her, where she died, and all those things. It enhanced it. Like I, mm -hmm. I, her, I love those corsets. I mean, like, and part of it is is my particular lens through which I experienced the world. And I wore those, you know, and and, and like the yeah. fabric was the same. And like it's almost like I could mm -hmm. smell them through the glass because they smell like. It's not great. And you know, like they yeah. were, there were stains on it. And like, and I just remember it being like, oh, so ugly, like, this is so gross. And then like seeing it in a museum um, was like being acknowledged, like this is an art object. Like she drew on it, she decorated yeah. it. Like she lived in it. It's like, that to me was power. And I, I loved that. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. everything about it made me, was resonant with me in some, in some way. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I think back to a passage in your book where you're really expressing a desire that you, you know, that that we could behold other people's bodies as beautiful mm -hmm. with all of these elements. You and you know, you're talking about I, I want to be beheld in full with my prosthetic limb, all of it, and be seen as beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, I think that's really what your book is about and that you can't actually do that alone. You know, it's not, it's not you as an individual trying to achieve that. And I think you're in the book, you're, you talk about like trying to compensate for your whole life by exercise or, or whatever it might be mm -hmm. that um, to shape your body and in certain ways. And um, I think just maybe we could end there in a way, just the, the idea that um, people can't get over or 
or heal from these issues of how they view their body on their own. It has to be, the body has to be beloved by another. It does. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, a great way to end. I love that. But I don't want to end. I want you to end. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'll just say that like, you know, my son who was, you know, blind and couldn't move and was very, I mean, he had everything was going wrong with his body. I mean, I thought he was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen in my life. Obviously I was his mother. So I thought that, but I just, I felt like I was being really objective. I'm sure I wasn't, but like, I, he was so beloved to me, like not just the idea of him, but his, his actual body and all of its compromised ways yes. I just yeah. like loved him and I think that that's it, he was you know I wish I could have learned that lesson a different way but that was a big thing that I that I, surprised me about mm. parenting him for the oh, short time yeah. I was able to yeah yeah and you know that it comes out in the title of your book um your your second book the still point of the turning world that Ronan was that stillness and that Part, in part, that stillness is him, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Emily. We're gonna end there mm -hmm. and, you know, perhaps we could just like, um, I don't know. I feel like just saying that this is in part, this is all uh, for Ronan in a way, <laughs> I, I feel like, and, and also just you as um, a mother of two children. Mm -hmm. and and just for everybody in the audience like this book is just so beautiful and you you also get to meet in the book um charlie uh emily's daughter who's just turned seven and is a uh, remarkable funny and uh smart and <laughs> wondrous child so um you you get to meet charlie and the experience too charlie's view of her mother's body as a mm -hmm. beloved, amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I hope everyone, please do buy this book. Um, I think it will just do uh, everyone a world of good um, to have read it. Everyone so, buy Katie's books too. Everyone read Katie's books. No, no, it's, it's not about, no, no, no. Yes, yes, <laughs> my, yes. my work is more, <laughs> more known through your work, I think, <laughs> when you quote me. So poets, we don't sell, we don't sell. <laughs> um anyway all right thanks emily thank you thanks, everyone Katie. for coming thank you and so thanks much to everyone the free library thanks, yes. thanks, thank thanks you for us.